question for Dr. Donna, please do leave it on my page and I will be happy to answer the question for you. Welcome to another episode of Talking with Dr. Donna. I'm your host, Dr. Donna White Carey, and thank you for keeping your appointment. As you know, you have an appointment with the doctor every Thursday at 6.30 p.m. I know we're a little late tonight, but it is still 6.30-ish. <laughs> so thank you so much for tuning in and bearing with us tonight. We have a great show and a great guest, so I definitely want to make sure you are here for your appointment. Um, so... I'm going to start out tonight's show a little different because the world is a little different and we had experienced tremendous trauma over the last couple of weeks and that trauma has been uh, a result of gun violence. We have had multiple massacres over the last couple of weeks and I just wanted to pause and give reverence to the lives that we've lost and not just in those massacres but the lives that we lose across this country um, every single day from people whose names may not ever be in the news, um, young men, young women predominantly of color that we continue to lose to gun violence. And I know that you may be saying, well, Dr. Donna, what can we do? Is there anything that we can do? And I want to encourage you today that yes, there is absolutely something you can do. Number one thing that you can do is to not remain silent. If you see something, if you know someone is perpetrating violence, if you are aware that someone um, in your community, in your neighborhood, in your family that might be perpetrating violence, that you say something. We cannot be held hostage to this gun violence and these massacres that we're, we're seeing. And we definitely need to think about the amount of guns that are in our community, in our homes, in our, um, in our, in our world. And when we
All right. <laughs> Can you hear me? Let me know. Thumbs up in the chat. Say, yes, we hear you, Dr. Donna. Comment. Are you with me? All right. I can see me. I can hear me. So I'm going to assume that you can see and hear me as well. So thank you for hanging in there with our technical difficulties. There's always something. Every time, you know, you try to talk about something that is really going to make a difference, all of a sudden the sound goes out. Is that coincidence? I don't think so. Um, great. So thank you so much for letting me know that you can hear me. Um, as I was saying, we were talking about the prevalence of gun violence in uh, this world. We were talking about the impacts of that gun violence on communities of color and in particular uh, black children who have been the most impacted by uh, gun violence. And we were talking about generational health. Now, as you know, on this show, we are committed to generational health. That's what we're, we talk about every single week. That is our um, purpose for this show, that we think about generational health. So when we think about the four pillars that we have of generational health, one of those pillar, pillars is mental and emotional health. And so the impact of gun violence on our communities is not just the impact of the loss of life. That would be our physical pillar. But we also think about our spiritual pillar. What does that feel like in our community? Um, how do we continue to uplift the spirituality of our common communities and thinking about how that impacts our health? Our emotional and mental health and our physical health and our environmental health, all right? Those are the four pillars that we talk about every single week when we think about generational health. And when we think about how gun violence, how school massacres, how um, going to the grocery store, how going to church, right? All of these are impacting the four pillars of our health that we talk about every single week. So it's not just the physical death but it is the lasting impacts of, of stress, of trauma on the lives of people in our community. Can you move the slide to the um, effects of violence in the community? So when we look at how does gun violence affect us? So we know that it doesn't just impact us in terms of our physical, but it really does impact our stress level our depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, right? We already have an overabundance of stress in our communities, but to also think about how this added piece of gun violence completely compounds this, what is already a stressful in many, many communities of color. Not just on the victims, but on their families, the bystanders, all of us. I know I felt even a tremendous amount of stress sending my kid back to school, sending them back to school after yet another school shooting. Because as if you're not paying attention, it's not just in one community. It's not just impacting um, one community. But we had communities, almost every community of color was impacted over these last two weeks. There was predominantly African Americans in the grocery store, predominantly Asians in the church, and uh, predominantly Latinx kids in this latest school massacre. Almost every community of color is impacted. You're impacted and I'm impacted. impacted. So what can we do? We've got the power of our pen, the power of our vote. We need to make sure that the people who are representing us represent us. And if they don't represent us and what we are, um, what we want them to do, we need to vote them out. This is not a time to be complacent. This is an election year. So you want to vote and make sure that the people who are representing us represent us and what is important to us. And this issue should be important to you and to me. So 
Thank you for letting me get on my soapbox for just a minute, but I understand that this is this has to stop. We have to we have to do something. And we can't just no longer think that it's happening in other places outside of ourselves. It's happening to us right here and right now. Um, so thank you. Um, like I said, you have an appointment every Thursday at 6.30 p.m. with your doctor, and tonight is no different. And tonight we are going to talk about a health topic that is um, important. I always talk about the fact that we need a dream team, right? I always say you got to have a dream team who takes care of you. And that dream team includes a primary care physician who's going to take care of everything in terms of your body. We have the dentist who's going to take care of your teeth, right? A specialist if you have any chronic medical conditions. And finally, a part of your dream team has to be your optometrist. Now, I wear glasses, so my optometrist, she sees me all the time. <laughs> um, and I am so thankful to have her as my guest tonight on our show. So I'm going to bring on my optometrist, Dr. Ursula Munsami, who is the owner of Eye Care Optometry, which is in Oakland on Lakeshore Avenue. If you're looking for an optometrist or if you're looking for fabulous glasses, everyone always compliments me on my glasses and they all come from Dr. Munsami's practice. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Munsami. We're going to bring her on and we're going to talk about vision and our eyes and why it's important that they that someone like Dr. Munsami, an optometrist, is a part of your dream team. Um, so Dr. Munsami grew up in South Africa. Um, she moved here with her parents and five siblings um, during the height of the apartheid system. Um, she attended UC Berkeley and graduated with a degree in molecular cell biology and then uh, remained at UC Berkeley to receive her degree of optometry. She's been practicing here in Oakland for the past 22 years. Wow, I think Dr. Monsami, I think you've been my optometrist for about that long. <laughs> <laughs> and she's enjoyed helping people see better and maintain healthy sight. So talking with Dr. Donna, Please welcome Dr. Ursula Munsami, and let's talk about your eyes. Hi, Dr. Munsami. Hi. So <laughs> nice to be with you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Donna. <laughs> Thank um, you so much for being here. It's, it's such, such a, a such, such a privilege, privilege to be with, to be with such an honorable, honorable doctor. doctor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we've known for many years, and, and, and I trust so, so much, much, and, and I, feel I feel so privileged, privileged to be our goal. Well, thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, and so, a lot of people think that um, you know, you only need an optometrist if you wear glasses. And so tonight, we really want to talk about how healthy eyes, um, how the importance of having healthy eyes, and why you need to see an optometrist, whether you wear glasses or not, right? Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> walk us through, like, why do I need to go to an optometrist? What, what is it that you all do, and why do we need to see an optometrist? So... It's believed, it's believed that, that about 80% of what a child, of what a child learns. learns. I think I'm getting a bit of a feedback. Bit of feedback. Are you guys? A little bit, yes. Some, some, I'm, wondering I'm wondering if... if like, maybe turn... I don't, maybe... Turn the volume down on turn your... Turn the volume down? Um, okay. Let me see. Does that help? Yes, much better. Oh, perfect. Okay. So 80% of what a child learns in school is from information that's presented to them visually, you know? So I think it's extremely important for kids and adults to be seeing well so they can learn well. And lots mm. of times people don't know what they're supposed to see, especially kids, you know, they, they can live in a blurry world without really knowing. And so then sometimes that can put them behind in school. And so what we do at an eye exam, we suggest everyone have an eye exam, whether you see well or not, you know, and, um, 
when when you when you come in for your eye exam what we do is we we first check your health history because like dr donna said there's generational health and so there's genetic conditions that are going to be passed on to you possibly and so we check that family history we check your health history because there's medications that you take or there's conditions that you have that could affect your eyes and so it's important for us to first get that when you when we start out and then when we take you into the exam room, we check your distance vision, we check your close vision, we make sure there's no refractive errors like nearsightedness, which is myopia, or farsightedness, which is hyperopia, or astigmatism that may be causing you to not see as best as you can. And then we we check that your eyes work together as a team too. So we try and find that prescription that's going to work well for you and then check that those eyes work together as a team because sometimes you could have excellent vision in each eye, but together they don't work well. And then you feel like, oh, I still have so much of eye strain. Even though when I cover one eye, I see well, I cover the other eye, I see well, but with both eyes together, I'm struggling. And so, so we check that they work together as a team because if they don't, then you also don't have good depth perception. And so another important test that Dr. Donna called the horrible test <laughs> is the eye pressure test. <laughs> because I'm sure all, most of you know it as the poof, <laughs> you know, the little air <laughs> puffs in your eye to check your pressure. Now that's quite an important test for any eye exam because your eye pressures can go pretty high without you knowing that there's anything wrong. And when your pressures go too high, then you can have damage to the nerve inside your eyes and you can slowly lose side vision without realizing it. And then people say, oh, that's strange. How could I lose side vision? How could I lose vision without knowing? Like, wouldn't I know? But it's your side vision, your peripheral vision that you lose. Your central vision is what you use to see all this detail all the time. But when you lose side vision, you don't realize it until it comes pretty close because it's non-detailed vision. And then when it, when you start going, oh, I'm bumping into things or I'm tripping on one side, then you'll know actually that you've actually lost some some peripheral vision. So, um, so we always check your pressures and we check your peripheral vision too because there's different diseases that can affect your vision and cause you to lose either peripheral vision or central vision. So we check the, that visual field to make sure you have that. Cause that another thing is people can have 20, 20 vision and can be considered legally blind. And that's when their visual field is really constricted. And those kind of people, they'll see 20, 20, but they won't be able to tell the lines on the, on the road. So they won't be able to stay in their lane because they don't have that peripheral vision that gives them that um, perspective. And then um, then we do what we call a slit lamp exam. And with this, it's a big microscope where we can look with both eyes and look at the, the front of the eyes, your lids, your lashes, the front of the eyes, the cornea, which is kind of the w window that you look through your conjunctiva, which covers that white area on your eye, your iris, your lens. And then we do the thing that everybody doesn't like, which is we put a little drop in and that opens up the pupil really wide. And so they, the reason people don't like it is when they leave, it takes about 20 minutes or so to kick in. But when they leave, they're a little blurry up close and so usually close vision gets blurry and then they get very light sensitive for a few hours. But it's a very important test because it helps us really look inside and see if there's any, there's so many things that can happen inside the eyes. There's bleeding that can happen. There's little thinned areas. There's moles. There's little freckles. And so without that, that dilation, we're just going to see a little portion. But now with those pupil nice and big, we're able to look at that whole um back of the eye. So, so eye exams are important, not only for seeing, which is a big, big part of it, because you want to be seeing well so that you can function well, but it's also to make sure that you don't have anything that's going to cause you to lose vision later on. Wow, that's a lot. I mean, you know, 
<laughs> that, those are all so many different reasons why it's important to get your eye exams. Um, and how often do you recommend people to come in and get this eye exam? So usually if you have something that we're watching, we say every year, right? So if there's a family history of glaucoma every year, kids too that are changing, you know, some kids, we want them to be a little farsighted when they begin because then they get less and they go to zero and then they go to nearsightedness. And so they say your first eye exam should be within that first year of life, around nine months of age or so. And that's to catch the big things because some kids are born with cataracts or glaucoma. Or some kids have um, prescriptions that are really big and they need to get glasses early so that they can get the input early. And so we can get prescriptions without people saying anything. You know, we just don't have it as refined, <laughs> but we don't need you to answer that one or two for the refractions. So we do that. And then right before they go to school and you want to do that before they go to school exam, because you don't want your kids to be at school and not seeing the board and not seeing and not knowing that they're not picking up certain things. And then, and those exams, we usually dilate because we want to get a nice baseline to see how, to make sure that kid's vision, you know, the kid's eyes are healthy. And then after that, every couple of years, unless they nearsighted and we go, hey, this child is going to progress, then we go oh. every year because you don't know if there's things that's going to change. And then, then on other people, from 18 to 40, maybe every two years is fine, but any conditions every year, diabetes every year, high blood pressure that's not controlled every year, cholesterol that's not controlled every year. And then if we tell you, hey, there's a little freckle we're watching inside your eye, or there's a thinned area, you're at risk for a retinal detachment, go in every year because why catch something when it's too late? You know, right. it's so much harder to treat when you get a retinal detachment that happened with no symptoms and now it's so far gone and you go, oh, we should have caught this earlier. It could have been treated and now you need so much more treatment just because you didn't come in on time. Or we've had people, we've had surprises where people come in with way high pressures and you're like, oh, with no pain, nothing, and already damage to their visual fields. And you're like, if you just came in last year, we would have got this. But you decided to stay away for two years or three years. You know? so, so that's important. So you see, your dream team, you have to see your dream team every year. Now, you said something about kids, and I want to pivot a little bit to kids because... Yes. Um, we know, we talk a lot about eye strain or screen time and how much, you know, should we allow our kids to watch TV or play on their video games? What's your thoughts about how much time kids should spend on computers okay. or watching TV or little mobile phones? What's, you know, from a health, eye health perspective, what is your thoughts? The studies definitely show that the more close work they do, the more nearsighted they can become. They can progress in that nearsightedness. So we always say, if they're watching a movie on their phone, you watch, you rather stream it to the TV because further is a little better than up close. And then when you're on your device, don't hold your phone way up here. Hold it a little further, put your computer screen a little further. And there's a thing that you should follow. It's called 20, 20, 20. So every 20 minutes, you want to look far away, clear something far away. Because lots of times when you're working up close, especially kids, their muscles spasm and they don't, they can't relax. So they look away and they all blurry. They have to look away until they clear something in the distance and then come back. So we say every 20 minutes, look 20 feet away for about 20 seconds or until that distance target is cleared and then you come back. So 20 minutes, 20 feet away, 20 seconds. So it's a good thing to kind of remind yourself or else you're going to sit there. We do the same thing because adults yes. get digital eye strain too because we sit there hunched over, our computer's too close. And so we need to remind ourselves too to take those, take those breaks, you know. Yes, I love that. 20, 20, 20. I'm so, mm -hmm. I'm going to start that for myself because I know especially now having working remotely, I feel like um, 
you know, how I wear my glasses changes and what I need to do changes. I do a lot more where I take my glasses off to look at things close up than I used to. And, um, you know, is that a, is that a result, um, like our eyes changing of being on computers and watching TV and being on our screens a lot more often? Kids are deaf. So adults are definitely getting what we call the digital eye strain. We all are actually, where you get drier eyes too, because people are not blinking enough. They've watched them, they blink half the amount. And then mm -hmm. when they do blink, they blink incompletely. And blinking, mm -hmm. every time you blink, you release oil, right? And that oil is the top layer of your tears. So it kind of protects your eye. So if you're not blinking, your eyes are gonna dry out. And then when they dry, you get these little areas that slough off. You start getting light sensitive. You go outside and go, oh, the sun bothers me. Oh, my eyes just feel like there's something in them. And so so you want to re... Lots of people, those glands also plug up. So do if you do some warm compresses on your lids when you take your shower to kind of open them up, and then you do your remind yourself to blink. It's kind of weird for us to tell you to remind yourself to blink <laughs> but because blinking is a natural thing. But if you don't blink fully, you're not going to get that nice tear foam and you're going to get more eye strain and then look away, you know. And so for kids, um, they also getting more dry eye. We never had kids with dry eye before. And now we're getting kids where we look at their glands and we're like, oh, these glands are plugged up because they're not wow. blinking well. They just sit in there, they staring at their screens. And so those glands become, they just become stagnant, you know. So warm compressors on the kids also when they take their showers and then remind them, hey, do the, when you blink, blink completely. <laughs> So that, and especially it's kind of a reminder when you do that 20, 20, 20 thing, when you look away, I always tell my son who's nine now, look away and blink. And he goes, mommy, I'm blinking. I'm blinking. Because <laughs> I want him to, to be able to get those glands to work, you know. Um, and then the, the bad thing about the close thing is it causes kids that are nearsighted, the more near work they do, the more they progress. And then the more nearsighted you become, then you become more at risk for eye diseases later on. So that's why there's all these studies going on with trying to, to slow down that progression and they're finding some stuff that works. But the main thing is with kids, do those breaks, try and look far away, try and if they're gonna watch a thing on the iPad, watch it on TV instead, you know, and so that you're not so close. And then the studies are showing that kids that are outside more uh, progress much less in their nearsightedness. And so so I think the confounding thing there is when they're inside, they're not just inside, they are their devices. You right. know, so it's it's yeah. being inside and being doing your close stuff again. <laughs> yeah. Yes, right. Right. Okay, that's great. So a lot of um this craze now we're sort of hearing a lot about blue lights it's particularly if you're doing a lot of work on the computer screens they're saying oh you should wear you know glasses that have a blue light or you're outside what is this new or maybe it's not new craze, but craze <laughs> exactly around blue lights can you talk to us a little bit about that so so the research on that is actually not conclusive we do know that blue light is actually something that can can contribute to macular degeneration, right? But we don't really know if these devices are actually emitting enough blue light to make a difference. They haven't been able to totally prove that as yet. They know also that blue light can cause, they think visual strain too, and they think sleep disruption. We don't know if it's just blue light or light itself too, that can cause you to not sleep well. And so they think with these blue light glasses, you may sleep better if you have that blue light protection. Um, but the verdict is not totally out there that computers or, or um, you know, or your devices emit enough blue light to actually uh, cause those things, but we don't know. I mean, 20 years from now, because now we're doing so much of computer now, especially since the pandemic, if everybody starts getting macular degeneration, then we're going to say, hey, maybe we should have told everyone to use their blue light glasses. We just haven't yet totally proved that that's the case. 
So would you say there's any harm necessarily in um, getting like the blue light screens or getting blue light? Or no. would you recommend just taking the breaks and doing the things that you recommended? I don't think there's any harm in getting it. I actually got one for myself too. Um, just because I feel like we don't know everything as yet. So mm -hmm. why not try whatever we can, right? Because later right. on as studies go on, we learn more and more. We always, sometimes what we think is good now may not be good. And sometimes what's, what is good now later on, they're going to they're gonna say, no, it actually wasn't good, you know? So that's very know. true. <laughs> yeah. That's very true. Um, so to all of you out there who might be watching, and this might be your first time here, know that there's the chat section and we like to ask questions and answer questions. So if you have a question for Dr. Moonsami, put it in the chat. I'm monitoring the chat. Um, I see M. Gonzalez is very busy on the chat tonight. <laughs> Oh, that, I guess that's my little boy. <laughs> yeah, that's your little boy. <laughs> he's very busy and he's he is absolutely admitting that he's not doing his homework, that he's watching his mommy instead. <laughs> but if you have any you questions, <laughs> if you have any questions, please do put them in the uh, chat section and uh, for Dr. Monsami, we'll try to get to it. Um, okay, so oh, um, let's talk a little bit about um, correction to our vision. And I know that people might see their prescription and it has like OD on it and it has these numbers and all these minus signs. What the, what the heck does all of that mean? <laughs> so, so we just, just think of your eyes, this little ball, right? And if light doesn't come and focus on that macula, on that retina, then you're going to be blurry. So it either focuses in the front and now you have this blur spot or it focuses in the back or there's a few blurry spots there, which like a couple of them, and then you have astigmatism. So the glasses just bend light and put it in the right spot. So some people are farsighted, which means their eyes are too small. So now they need a plus lens to pull that because now their blurry spot is behind their eye. So they got to pull it or, they, or their focal point is behind the eye. So they got to pull that focal point back onto the retina. And then people that are nearsighted, it's in front. And so then we put lenses to pull it back onto that retina. If you have astigmatism, you have different power in the one than the other because you have two blurry spots. And so then you have, if you took your glasses and could turn it, you know, then your vision will get blurry because you have that different different curvatures on the lens so then that so you'll have three numbers instead of one number so if you see a <laughs> plus sign you're farsighted for distance if you see a minus sign you're nearsighted for distance and if you see three numbers with the uh you know first second and then the cylinder then it means you either farsighted or nearsighted but have astigmatism with it but all of them is just to get that focal point onto the retina and lots of people say oh I didn't wear my glasses so that's why my vision went bad and then others say I wore my glasses and that's why my vision went bad. Yes. <laughs> so, so Is there so any truth to that? Is there any truth to like if you wear your glasses too much that it actually makes your vision worse? There's some conditions so there's some kids that have a risk of amblyopia which is where your vision doesn't correct to 2020. And for them, we will tell the parents, try to keep these glasses on at all waking hours. Um, but for us that are a little nearsighted, a little farsighted, if you, it's clear with it on and blurry with it off, you know? And so if you don't like to wear it and you don't mind being a little blurry, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like being clear, so I wear mine, you know? Um, yes. Really really matter for kids they think the more you work so some kids will say hey if you're nearsighted take them off up close because then you're working less at the computer than with them on when you get older then you need different glasses for distance and different glasses for close and whatever we'll do we prescribe what's comfortable for you okay and i just want to level set because i've heard 
many times people be confused about what does nearsighted actually mean and what does farsighted mean. So can you just define those terms? What does it mean to be nearsighted? Near What's the problem with your eyes versus farsighted? So nearsighted, you see near. So you can see close better than in the distance. Your distance is going to be blurry. Your eyes are a little longer than it should be. And so then things are not focusing right on that retina. They focus in the front, right? And then farsightedness, you see better in the distance than close, but eventually your distance blurs too. And so people always get confused with that because they go, oh, but my distance is blurry. Am I nearsighted or am I farsighted? But with farsightedness without your glasses, you'll always be much worse up close than in the distance even though your distance will blur too. With nearsightedness, you pull off your glasses and go, oh, I can see up close, but I need them, you know, for distance. Whereas farsighted people can't pull off their glasses. They have to keep them on because if they pull them off, they blurry everywhere, <laughs> <laughs> especially if you're more farsighted. Great, thank you for that. Okay, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, one question is, um, if you lose your vision from diabetes, is there a possibility to reverse that or um, is it too damaged and you can't reverse that type of vision loss? There is a possibility to reverse that. It depends. There's so many stages of, of diabetic retinopathy. You know, so it depends on how much of damage there is. If it's really bad and people get retinal detachments and stuff, then they could have irreversible vision loss. But I've seen a lot of people with lots of bleeding in the back of the eye and they get treatment and then are able to to reverse that, that damage. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. All right. But they There's... have to be followed really carefully because because sometimes they, it can be going in the wrong way. Diabetes is a big cause of vision loss. So, so you yeah. really have to, if you have diabetes, do not miss yearly exams at all. Go in every year because you can have damage that you don't know you, that you didn't know you had because you'll have perfect vision, but they'll be bleeding out on the sides. And so then when we, when we dilate and look inside, we'll be able to, to find those things before they, before they get bad. So right. do not miss yearly eye exams. And then if you go, oh, it's the middle of the year. And she said, don't miss yearly eye exams. <laughs> 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 <It's just gone. laughs> something happens like that, you go in then. <laughs> so very, you, very you good. Decrease. Don't decrease, go in then. Yeah. Yes, don't wait. <laughs> if there's any vision loss, go exactly. in immediately, right? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Okay, another question. Um, these new eye drops, Vuity? Vuity? Vuity. Vuity. Yes. Um, are they okay for nearsightedness and those who have astigmatism? So the eye drops, are they okay to use? If you get prescribed that drop, make sure you have a comprehensive exam because it's, it's, it's a drop that's been around for a while. Um, but there is risk of retinal detachment there too. So you want to make sure that you have no risk factors for like thinning in the retina, so for retinal detachment. And then, and then when you get prescribed that drop, make sure you get followed really well, you know, because it, um, it helps you see up close and it works for some people and not, but it does have some side effects too. So, so just make sure you don't just get it prescribed and don't have your full eye exam and then something goes wrong, um, you'd wanna be, be followed quite, quite carefully with that drop. Great. Um, another question, does blepharitis go away eventually or is it a lifelong issue? So maybe first define mm -hmm. what is blepharitis for people who don't know and then mm -hmm. will it go away or is it, you'll have it forever? So blepharitis, uh, can be, be a chronic condition. Blepharitis is everyone at their lashes has bacteria that live there sometimes. And so so they can deposit stuff and, and then cause your, your lids to get inflamed and you'll get these little like dandruff stuff at the lashes. And so 
some people it's a chronic thing so you have to keep making sure that you take care of it and some people will have a bout of it and then it can go away you know and even that my bomian gland dysfunction that oil gland thing is a sort of blepho blepharitis too you know but um but it's considered posterior and then the anterior is where the where the lashes grow so it's just an inflammation of the of the the eyelids and the lashes where the lashes grow kind of so Great. Um, okay, uh, the last thing I want us to talk about and to see if there's any more questions, this is your opportunity. But the last thing I wanted to talk about is that people always talk about sort of permanent corrective uh, vision, things like Lasix. Um, mm -hmm. And is that something that, you know, if you're just kind of tired of wearing your glasses, you should think about or what are some of the things that you should consider when you're considering whether or not you want to move some to, towards something more permanent than just wearing glasses or contacts? I think, yeah, you have to really think carefully about it because it all depends on what your prescription is. You know, there's some people that have just a little bit of nearsightedness and then they have LASIK and they think, oh, now I can't, especially if you're over 40, because then they can't see up close. And they go, oh, I didn't realize that it's going to correct my distance, but not my clothes. You know, so so you have to really look when you think of LASIK or so, look at the numbers that you have. And then um, and then also make sure that you're a really good candidate, because if you're not a good candidate for LASIK, then there's a chance that there's can be more risks or more more complications from it, actually. Yeah, so yet another reason to actually go in, talk with your eye doctor, get a good referral to someone who's reputable because you only get, you know, one pair of eyes and you want to yes. make sure that whoever is going to do perform that procedure that they really know what they're doing, right? We talk about that all the time. Make sure you ask, well, how many of these have you done? <laughs> right? <Exactly. laughs> yes. You definitely don't want me doing it. So you want someone who definitely knows what they're doing to have performed that surgery. Okay, so Dr. Munsami, thank you so much for all of your information. You got lots of people really appreciative of your information. Is there anything else that you want to tell us or that we should know about our eyes and our vision health? I think just keep your eyes healthy, make sure you get your yearly eye exams so that way you can enjoy your life. I think vision is such a big part of our lives. And I think I feel so blessed that I didn't know what career I was gonna choose when I started out and I got, you know, um, slowly pushed into looking into this career of optometry. I hadn't even had an eye exam when I was, by the time I was in college, because when we were young, we grew up in South Africa, we only went when there was issues. And lucky, my parents had six kids and none of us had any eye issues. <laughs> so, so we didn't have exams until later. And so I went and watched a couple of optometrists and saw what they did. And I thought, this is a really nice field. And I think it's so nice. I feel happy that I can help people see better. I think that's what makes me so happy every day. We've got a great staff that we work with that um, we just feel like a family and we feel like we, um, we're we blessed to be able to help people see because we think that's such an important, um, you know, thing that we, that God gave us. So, so definitely take care of your eyes. It's an important part of your body. <laughs> And yes, it's part and of that whole body that will make absolutely. And I can totally vouch for your staff and for you that you guys are wonderful and patient because <laughs> every time I come in, like, let's try on 20 pairs of glasses to help me find my glasses. <laughs> uh, but just a great staff, super friendly. So if you need an optometrist or your optometrist is not a part of your dream team, remember I said your optometrist, you should really be able to ask questions of and be available to you. So if you have an optometrist, but you're not feeling your optometrist, well, Dr. Munsami, are you open? For, you're open for a new business, right? 
Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And we will definitely make sure to link her contact information to this episode. So if you go back and watch it, you'll also be able to see how to contact her to make an appointment with her office. And like I said, her staff is lovely and wonderful as well. So thank you again for watching another episode of Talking with Dr. Donna. As you know, you have an appointment every Thursday at 6.30 p.m. with the doctor. If you are not already subscribed to my YouTube channel, I want to say, please, if you learned anything tonight that was worth your time watching, then please do me the favor of subscribing to my channel. Thank you again, Dr. Munsami, for giving of your time and energy and knowledge for free to us tonight. We really, really appreciate it. So for you all talking with Dr. Donna, this is the end of our, our what, spring season. We're going to take a couple of months off to just relax, be with our families. We will continue to continue to update you, but just in terms of your health, just not in this same format. So continue to come back, watch us, look for us on YouTube here, talking with Dr. Donna. We will definitely give you information about your health throughout the summer, but it will be in a different format. So thank you again. As always, take care of yourself. Remember, you know we always do a food of the month and this is the only, you have like a week left to get in our food of the month this month, which is avocados just in case you forgot start adding the avocados with that good healthy fat to your meals to your salads to breakfast to you know chips and you want to have some chips and guacamole use and eat avocado to really get those benefits of the healthy fat and lots of vitamins you can add it to a smoothie you can add it to so many different things so one more week share with us your recipes for um, how you're using and blending and putting avocado in your meals. And just remember that your diet is important. And what you put into your body is going to help make sure that what comes out of your body is your best. So thank you again. This is all of the different ways in which you can follow me uh, on YouTube, of course, talking with Dr. Donna. You can go on Instagram. Um, at my Dr. Donna, always keep up with me and I will keep up with you. If there's a topic or information you want to know about during the summer while we're on break, just let me know. Hit me on, Insta, uh, on the messenger and just say, hey, Dr. Donna, we'd love to hear about this topic and we will definitely add it to our queue. All right. Anything else? Yes, of course. You know, we're still in our pandemic still doing vaccines. So if you have not gotten your primary series of vaccines, nor if you haven't gotten your booster, tomorrow uh, from noon to 4 p.m., we are offering free vaccinations and your, that includes your boosters as well as testing at 896 Newton Carey Jr. Way, formerly Isabella Street from noon to four. It's free for all ages who are um, um, recommended for a vaccine, so ages five and above. We have pediatric vaccines, adult vaccines, and of course, boosters for teens and um, for adults, okay? Remember, wear a mask. We're not out of this yet. The pandemic is not over. Continue to protect yourself and your loved ones and be careful about where you're going and what you're doing because COVID is not on vacation and it hasn't left, okay? All right, thank you so much for continuing to support Talking with Dr. Donna, for being here every Thursday and keeping your appointment. I really appreciate it. I hope you've learned something this evening, and I hope you will continue to follow me as we go through this summer. But take care of yourselves, take care of your families. Until we see each other again, take care. <laughs>